Uh, welcome to our lunchtime conversation with uh, Professor Michael Ignatieff. Uh, I'm Victor Bailey, Director of the Hall Center. Um, I introduced Michael at length and fulsomely last evening. So this afternoon, suffice it to say that he is the uh, Edward R. Murrow Professor of Practice at Harvard's Kennedy School. Um, and I'll only really repeat one sentence from last night's introduction, which he, he is one of the most uh, influential voices in the global debate on human rights and on the international responsibilities of nations, especially Western nations. Uh, our theme today, which Michael will introduce uh, fairly briefly, is what citizens owe strangers, human rights, migrants, and refugees. So once again, please welcome Professor Michael Ignatieff. Uh, thanks very much. It's uh, nice to be here. Um, and uh, my topic is, um, uh, I hope my topic is well fit, suited to this audience. Many of you, uh, I'm discovering to my alarm, know an awful lot about refugee and migration policy, so I hope I haven't missed that target. And then there may be some of you who don't know, haven't really thought about it, so I may miss that target too. So we'll have to see how we do. But uh, I hope we have a good discussion, and that'll bring my, my targeting within the right, within the right range. Um, my subject, uh, what citizens owe strangers, human rights, migrants, and refugees. Um, simple definitions here. A, a, a migrant is someone basically uh, leaving their country uh, uh, for a better life or for opportunity, but in theory at least has the capacity to return to that country in some form. Um, there is also forced migration, however, in which people uh, flee uh, chaos and civil war uh, and are, uh, have a great difficulty getting back. So the line between a migrant who can, in theory, return home and a refugee who has lost their right to return home or cannot return home for fear because of a well-founded fear of persecution. The line between a refugee and a migrant is uh, extremely complex, both legally and morally, uh, and we may want to get into that. But I'm setting up a simple distinction between a citizen who has rights to live and abode and leave and return from a country, uh, a migrant who's seeking entry to that country, uh, a refugee who's fleeing their own country because of a well-founded fear of persecution. That's a kind of uh, simple distinction between these three uh, categories. As everybody knows, uh, migration in the 21st century has become uh, an absolutely global uh, phenomenon. Uh, there may be as many si as 60 million people on the move at any one time, um, and uh, some of the drivers here, I'm not going to get into causation, but we can talk about that, um, are first of all negative ones, uh, state failure and civil war. Um, we're still living, one way to think about our world is we're still sorting out the consequences of the end of empire. Uh, decolonization in Africa and Asia, uh, decolonization of the Soviet empire. Uh, there were 40 states in the world system in 1945. There are now 198. Um, that's what decolonization has done, but the consequences is that for many of these states, they don't work. They can't provide internal security. They can't provide opportunity for their citizens. And so they are creating constant uh, migration flows. Um, the second uh, driver of this is north-south inequality. Uh, the fact that the global economy is working uh, uh, pretty well for lots of rich countries, not so well for uh, countries in the global south. The division of labor between the two is creating situations in which many southern economies uh, don't function well or can't get terms of trade uh, that allow their people to live well. <clears throat> and one of the ways to think about migration is that it's an individual solution to the problem of underdevelopment. I mean, uh, one of the things you can see is that people um, uh, are 
rational actors in this sense. They're in a place like Mali or they're in a place like um, southern Sudan or they're in a place like Eritrea or they're in a place like Pakistan and they think uh, we've heard these promises of economic development but it's not going to come fast enough for me and so my solution is to smuggle myself in or seek to find opportunity in a in a, a, a rich country and then I can bring my family and I've achieved my economic development. So it's as if people are choosing individual solutions to the problem of persistent north-south uh, inequality. The third driver of this is the mobility revolution, uh, by which I mean the declining real costs of global transport uh, and the, um, uh, the spread of the internet, uh, the ways in which the world has shrunk. Um, I mean, 100 years ago, 75 years ago, if you sat in a poor, underdeveloped, poor society, a rich society was very far away, both in the economic terms, cost of getting there, and in terms of its simple visibility. Now you can sit in Senegal or Mali or, or uh, Niger, and with a, you know, if you've got internet access, and many do, you look at another life. You look at Brussels, you look at Paris, you look at London, and you think, why not me? Uh, the mobility revolution is a key uh, part of the story. And just a little sidebar on the mobility rev revolution. Um, if you look at the refugee flows into Europe in, uh, since the summer of 2015, there's been some wonderful reportage, particularly in Time magazine and some other places, in which they ask the refugees, and the migrants, what are you carrying in your backpack? And they, they all tell you the most important thing they're carrying is their cell phone. Why is the cell phone the most important thing? Because in many cases, the cell phone gives them GPS guidance for their route. Uh, the cell phone uh, allows them to communicate with other migrants in the chain. Uh, anthropologists of migration have studied chain migration for generations, uh, but these chains are now electronic. Um, uh, so that a Syrian refugee, you know, in the bottom of Greece knows that ahead of him is a refugee who's made it to Dortmund, and so they're exchanging information. Uh, this border is closed, this place is open, let's follow the flow. And, and that, uh, the mobility revolution, the technological revolution, has dramatically uh, leveraged and enhanced the capacity of migrants and refugees to find ways into uh, the global north. The final driver of all this is, I think, the rights revolution, the sense in which since 1945 we've tried to create international regimes that say that uh, migrants and refugees have some claim of right in the states that they're seeking entry to. And so the rights revolution has been a kind of pull factor, I think, uh, uh, enhancing uh, global flows of, of migration. And we know what it looks like. It looks like this. Uh, these are these extraordinarily dramatic uh, pictures of people, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 uh, a day coming across from the Turkish uh, border across the Aegean uh, to the Greek islands. Um, it is, that's one frontier of global migration, but here's one much closer. Uh, the constant streams up through the, um, Ar this is the uh, Arizona border. And so I get to my question, which is given these, these migration flows and refugee flows, um, what do citizens owe strangers? What do those who have rights and passports and entitlements in developed states owe this migration flow? Um, very roughly, quick and dirty, uh, you could say we owe them their three options. And these are absolutely central issues in the 2016 uh, election campaign. No prizes for who thinks option one is the, uh, is the right answer. We owe them nothing. Build a wall. Um, uh, citizens owe duties to citizens. They do not owe any duties to strangers. That's option one. Option two, a kind of softer, more sentimental one, we don't owe them duties in strict terms, but we should be compassionate. These are desperate people, and compassion should be the linkage that 
connects us. And the third one is a very different, more juridical understanding of this relationship. Uh, strangers have rights. Citizens have duties. Uh, so then the issue is if strangers have rights, what rights do they have? If citizens have duties, what duties precisely? And to which strangers? And to how many of them? And for how long, etc. cetera? Um, now, I want to focus I want to focus mostly on three. They have rights and we owe them duties. And I want to introduce you to uh, a person who thought about this as deeply as anybody. And the reason to talk to you a little bit about Hannah Arendt is that she was herself a refugee. Uh, this is one of the examples where insight and illumination about a problem comes from someone who's actually lived it. She was born uh, in Germany. Uh, had a brilliant academic career. When the Nazis took over, she was forced to flee Germany, first to France, and then uh, into exile in the United States. And in uh, <clears throat> the late 40s, she wrote a very memorable book called The Origins of Totalitarianism, which is a study of how the totalitarian Nazi regime and how the totalitarian Soviet communist regime became possible. But in the middle of this book is a very, very long and famous discussion of the issue of what uh, citizens owe strangers. Um, and she talked about it with feeling because she had experienced what it is to lose your citizenship. Remember that Jews in Germany were stripped of their citizenship and forced into uh, uh, exile. And she said this famous thing uh, about, uh, about the idea of rights, which I think we need to, to understand. She said the most important right that any human being has is the right to have rights, right? And then the question is, how do they get the right to have rights? And she said there are two ways you have the right to have rights. One of them is you have rights because you're a citizen. Your rights derive from the fact that you happen to be born or have uh, acquired citizenship in a particular nation state. That's where your rights come from. Your right to have rights comes from being a citizen. But what then about a stranger? What then about someone who's not a citizen of a country? Where do their right to have rights come from? And she says, well, the right to have rights as a, comes from the fact that you're a human being, that all human beings have a natural and inherent right to have rights. That's how we've thought about this. Uh, but she then has this very uh, tough and scathing thing to say. If a human being loses his political status, he should, according to the implication of the inborn and inalienable rights of man, come under exactly the situation for which the declaration of such general rights provided. That is, if a, a person ceases to be a citizen, they ought then to have rights as a human being. But actually, the opposite is the case. It seems that a man who is nothing but a man has lost the very qualities which make it possible for other people to treat him as a fellow human being. This is said by somebody who knew the full horror and panic of being stateless of being suddenly without rights as a citizen and going out and suddenly depending on the compassion of strangers, on the willingness of other citizens to take you in and discovering with fear and horror and alarm that she had no rights at all. And uh, so the whole international human rights regime since the Second World War has tried to give human beings rights irrespective of citizenship. To say all human beings have the right to have rights. And the International Refugee Convention gives you a couple of very specific rights. If you are fleeing a well-founded fear of persecution, you can go to another state, come to their border, and say, let me in. And you have a right to be admitted if you can prove that you have a well-founded fear of persecution. That's right number one. Right number two is that you ha have a right of non-refoulement, as they say. 
We have a French word, refouler, send back. Your right is, you have a right not to be sent back to be persecuted. And then in the torture convention, which we created in the 1980s, you have an absolute right not to be sent back to any place where you may be tortured. So irrespective of your citizenship, all human beings, the human beings in this room, have that right. And this is what's at stake right now <clears throat> in the European refugee crisis, is whether those rights can be cashed out, whether they're worth a darn thing uh, or not. And in the desperation to escape Syria, where um, people do not have rights, uh, where they're fleeing violent death, uh, families are doing, taking chances and taking risks which have horrified the world but which prove just how desperate they are. And we've ended up with this unbearable image which catalyzed everybody's sense of what true human desperation looks like. Uh, what people forget about this horrible image is that this child drowned because the family was fleeing the shelling of Kobani. By Kobani was a town held by the Islamic State. This is a Kurdish family that was getting away from, literally, from shell fire. No one would put their child in the risk of drowning unless they were in mortal fear of violent death. And this is what happened. And it was this photograph more than anything else that triggered a flow of compassionate responses. But the interesting thing is that this now, this photograph taken in September 2015 appears to belong to another world because now in March and April of 2016, the razor wire has gone up across Europe uh, there are 15,000 refugees, families like this, encamped near Macedonia, uh, unable to get into Europe. Uh, every day, uh, families in Greece, on the Greek islands, are being put on ferries and shipped back to Turkey. Uh, so the compassionate response triggered by this horrible photograph has essentially evaporated. And we're now into, I've talked a little bit about the rights of refugees and migrants, but um, uh, the rights of migrants, I gave you the rights of refugees, but not the rights of migrants. The rights of migrants are much more uh, uh, discretionary. That is, migrants have a right to enter the labor markets of developed societies, depending on whether they can get um, uh, visa permission and visa entry. They, they do not have the automatic right to um, uh, public assistance. They do not have the automatic right to um, uh, claim uh, protection from a state. They simply have a limited discretionary economic opportunity and they can be sent back. But now as, uh, now as a place like Germany faces the challenge of how to respond to the enormous pressure, there have been a million plus refugees coming into Germany since September. Um, they are faced with issues about how to balance two absolutely competing and contradictory uh, uh, issues. On the one hand, in, in other words, what I'm saying is it's not simply that the generosity of the Germans and the Europeans has dried up. There's another problem that we need to focus upon, which is that in theory, the human right that a refugee can claim to asylum is unlimited. That is, every single refugee who shows up at a state border has a right to individualized determination of their case and determination whether they have a well-founded fear of persecution or not. And it's an unlimited right. There's no cap on it, right? And what Western societies are discovering is that looks like an obligation you can shoulder when it's 20 or 30 or 100 or 1,000. But how do you shoulder that universal obligation when it's a million people, one after another? And suddenly, what you then have is a conflict between a universal obligation and what you could be called the pressure of democratic consent on the other side. Will citizens consent to accepting an obligation that has no upper limit? 
That's essentially the core of the problem in Germany. The Germans, for all kinds of reasons relating to their post-war history, are saying, we can't put an upper limit on our obligation to relieve and assist the desperate. And then they discover when you can't put an outer, outer limit on, you actually have to put an outer limit on because the citizens of the country are withdrawing consent from the process. So there's a conflict, in other words, between universal obligations, universal human rights obligations, and the principles of democratic consent and legitimacy. Right? And it's a real problem. And so how do you, um, if migrants and refugees have rights, how should and why should citizens respect them? And at what point do the simple volume of refugee entries begin to crack uh, public uh, consent? So I'm switching from the human rights here to the politics. And the politics are very, very tough. Let's now, I've given you some sense of what the issue is in Europe. Let me, and I'm not, don't worry, I'm not gonna go on forever. I wanna switch to uh, what we know about US public opinion. The facts on US, public uh, US treatment of Syrian refugees are that between 2011 and 2016, the United States has taken about 3,000 refugees. That's the number of refugees that Germany has been processing every day. So basically, the United States is not taking Syrian uh, refugees. And public opinion is pretty strongly against for reasons of security. That is, the refugee issue, uh, in the refugee issue, what trumps um, the willingness to take refugees is simply the concern about public safety and national security. So that's how the opinion, opinion public opinion looks in 2015. And that's unlikely to budge through, through the election year. Let me take you through another way to think about uh, American attitudes towards refugees and look at this poll. One of the things that is, I think, quite interesting is, yes, people are a little antsy about taking Syrian refugees, but they've always, Americans have always been antsy about being generous. The Hungarian refugees were not popular in 1958. The Indo-Chinese refugees, not popular in 1979. The Cubans in 1980. Uh, the Albanians, a little more so during the Kosovo War. But the interesting thing here now is that almost everybody who has any memory of this looks back on the Hungarian acceptance of Hungarian refugees and said that was a terrific thing to do. And everybody who thinks about the Vietnam refugees, at the time, very unpopular, and now everybody thinks they're terrific citizens. It's an interesting thing. They give it a little time, and people decide that generosity is actually pretty popular. But here's, here's a public opinion survey that's much more disturbing. This is about Jewish immigration in 1938. Gallup poll looking at, should we take desperate uh, refugees fleeing persecution from Nazi Germany. In 1938, 67% were against uh, taking refugees. That underscored President Roosevelt's policy, and we know what happened. Um, and I think we should be properly haunted by that, by a sense that here's an example where Democratic consent, democratic opinion uh, turned out to be deeply wrong historically, and we, we know how wrong uh, it, it was. So where do we, where do we go here? Um, one way to think about the politics of consent for refugees is that support is always a lagging indicator. If you ask anybody at a given time, should we do a generous and forward-thinking thing? Most Americans and most other countries say kind of no. Uh, so you, part of what makes the politics of refugees and migration so difficult is that politicians have to get ahead of public opinion in ways that are just very difficult for politicians to do, but also, on the other hand, have a payoff when they've done so. So it's a, it's a complicated story. And I think that one of the things that's extremely important about maintaining democratic consent uh, is effective border control, uh, lawful admission procedures, 
and lawful repatriation. And I can go into the detail of that. But no politician can hold power in a democratic country if people think that the borders are out of control. This is a reproach directed, I think, at liberal progressives who think we should just take everybody. You can't work democratic consent that way. You have to persuade the public that you've got the borders under some kind of control, that the uh, border system is not being gamed by traffickers, that it is not being gamed by coyotes, and uh, that the, the sovereign state has control of, of the situation. And it depends on a second thing, it seems to me, which is, um, consent for migrant migration, consent for refugees, depends on integration. That is, an integration I see as a two-way street that's mostly focused on the issue of the rule of law. We say yes to you, come on in, provided you say yes to us. That is, you play by the rules. Um, and that sets uh, the nature of the bargain. And the rules are essentially uh, respect for and obedience to the rule of law in democratic uh, society. And when you have that two-way consent, it seems to me you can sustain the politics uh, of migration in the 21st century. I mean, my sense is that uh, globalization means migration. Migration is the future. Migration is going to change our national identities, has our national identities are always changing. I think it will change identities for the good, provided that we have a two-way process of, of mutual consent. Uh, and I think that those nations who think that the response to globalization is to shut your doors are going to be left behind. Migration has been an incredible source of economic dynamism for the United States. If you, if you you know, any economist looking at what are the comparative advantages of the United States in the 21st century relative to other societies, migration would be absolutely at the top of the list. Uh, it renews the population. It guarantees future demographic growth. It is a source of independent innovation and fresh ideas. The ambition of immigrants has been a traditional driver of the whole society for economic reasons. And these kind of arguments will need to be made against those who pretend uh, otherwise. Um, building frontiers that shut countries off from migration is an absolute guarantee of intellectual, moral, cultural, and economic stagnation. Thanks for listening. Let's, uh, let's now uh, uh, go to questions and, and, and discussion. Don't be shy. Ah, there we are. Great. Um, yes, thank you for your talk. And um, I was wondering, I wanted to ask you about something because you navigated between um, talking about universal human rights and talking about border control. Yeah. And so in that, um, and so it was, I guess, both both humanistic and also pragmatic. Um, I'm wondering if you could comment on this recent EU-Turkey agreement, uh, which involves as far as I understand it, potentially forcible deportations uh, to Turkey. Um, is this um, a step back from post-World War II uh, rights of refugees to seek refuge to avoid well, uh, return? Um, or is this about the EU needing to, um, to basically enforce, enforce border security? Yeah. I think the, the simple answer to your question is yes, it's a step backward. But I think we have to understand the, the politics here. Um, I'm, a, I'm actually the son and grandson of refugees, so I got stake in this. My name is Ignatiev. I'm from Russian, Russians who were thrown out of Russia after the revolution. So I kind of feel very committed to uh, ref uh, a generous migration and refugee policies. But you have to maintain public consent for them, is what I'm saying. And in Germany, the consent is cracking. Um, and the consent is cracking, and the burden sharing in the European Union has broken down. I mean, the only country really taking refugees anymore is Germany, of, t of the 28. So in that situation, what do you do? You've got to send some people back. You just can't keep the flows at this level. 
Um, now, the way it's been done uh, may amount to detention, uh, and that would be a violation of, of international agreements. Um, if the one-for-one one thing, you know, you, you repatriate uh, one Syrian refugee from Greece to Turkey and you take one refugee to, uh, if that proceeds without an upper cap, that is, you take as many as that process generates, um, I think you can begin to see something that would look like a lawful uh, migration and refugee flow. The other issue here is that uh, you do have to do triage between the Pakistanis, the Afghans, the Eritreans, the Syrians, the thing. What, what is making this so dramatic is not just the Syrians, but huge volumes of other people. A lot of people being repatriated this week from Greece to Turkey are not Syrians at all. They're Pakistanis. So um, what I'm saying, just so it's be clear, so we get full disclosure, I'm saying things that are highly controversial in the human rights community. I and mean, the human rights community thinks that this, what is happening, these repatriations and these detaining of, of, of uh, refugees are a complete violation of the whole system. And I'm saying back, okay, yeah, we, we have a problem here, but are you seriously telling me that the Federal Republic of Germany should take everybody who comes in. It's just you're, you're ignoring the democratic consent side of this problem. And so I'm trying, to, I'm trying to see whether there's some pragmatic middle ground here in which you, have, you continue to have a strong uh, refugee flow, but it's triaged, it's filtered, and um, uh, you're, you're pushing away some of the economic migrants. You're taking uh, the refugees. Um, and we'll see what happens. But uh, the, the larger context here, of course, is that the whole of Europe has an open southern border. And it's quite possible that you get a fix in, in Greece and it just simply increases the flows into Italy. And so we'll see whether this thing, thing works. Am I troubled by what's happening? You bet. But I'm not, I'm not a human rights absolutist because I've been a politician and I just know you can lose everything if you don't maintain democratic consent. Um, hi. Um, I, so I guess I just have a short question. Um, so, you know, with climate change being what it is and like the future, like projections of what climate change might look like, mm -hmm. it brings up this huge question of what's going to happen to future refugees that are like, fleeing situations where they can't actually live in their homelands anymore because of the, you know, like, you know, the effects of climate change. Yes. And so with this current situation being what it is and things being so tense surrounding refugees, what do you think is like the future? Like, I don't think there's any like international will, if you will, to, you know, rewrite the international ref like refugee mm -hmm. clause, which doesn't have like any protection at all for environmental refugees. So what, what's the, what do you think? That's a, a good question and it, it uh, reminds me as an old professor that there's a serious deficiency in slide number one. I should be mentioning climate change is a driver of migration. There's no question that that's a serious. <laughs> Somebody's trying to send us a message here, don't you think? Um, it's an excellent point. Uh, but let's understand how tough the point is. Nobody denies that in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, desertification the spread of the desert is driving, uh, you know, Niger, Mali, all kinds of places like that, or the Sahel is spreading south and, and it's pushing people out of their livelihoods and uh, um, that change you can see in other places. Um, I've got students from the Maldives. Maldives are a little bunch of islands in the, in the Indian Ocean. The sea is rising inexorably. Uh, it's conceivable that those populations will have to be evacuated. Already um, uh, people from I think the Solomon Islands or some island in the Pacific have made a I'm a climate change refugee claim in New Zealand. It was rejected but they've made it. Uh, so that is emphatically a driver. The problem I think we've got is that uh, the minute you were to admit climate change as a grounds for refugee status um, or for legal migration status, 
uh, you open doors in ways that just may be unmanageable as a practical matter. Again, we're coming up against this issue of citizen's consent. Uh, and so I don't see a way to alter the Refugee Convention now. Um, what I see, on the contrary, is that instead of le reaching for, you know, international legal solutions prematurely, what we need to do is kind of sit down with the agronomist, sit down with the, the, um, the hydrological engineers in a place like Niger and Mali and figure out how do we stop the desert moving south? How do we increase the resilience of uh, agriculture in that area? How do we get irrigation into these places so livelihoods can be stabilized? That is, we've got to think about this in a different way. How, how, do, we, how do we then reform um, international um, uh, agri here, now let, me, let me do an issue that's relevant to Kansas. How do we reform uh, agricultural price supports uh, so that um, uh, primary producers in these countries are competing on a level playing field uh, with Lubbock, Texas, which produces an awful lot of cotton. Uh, you know, I have nothing against Lubbock, Texas. I want them all to do well, but I don't want them to do well at the expense of all those West African farmers who produce cotton and who, if we don't give them a decent price, are going to end up on our doorstep. I mean, that's what I'm, I'm saying. So we've got to think about the climate change problem as a problem of how we stabilize populations and, and, and give economic opportunity to people where they are, since a lot of people would like to stay where they are. I mean, it, it's, it is not the case that you can't keep them on the farm after they've seen Paris. A lot of people want to stay on the farm. And our problem is that the farms are being destroyed by climate change. So how can we help them to, to stay where they are? That would be how I would begin to see it. Uh, and we have to work that problem. In other words, we have to put the legal stuff, the moral stuff, and the economics and environmental economics to work on this problem, put it all together. I don't want to reduce you all to stunned silence. That's not my, that's not my intention. There are a lot of <clears throat> biblical literal, literalists who don't seem to understand the notion of hospitality uh, and yeah. compassion. And uh, in our public discourse, we don't hear much about this notion of I was yes. a stranger and you took me in, that kind yeah. of thing. And I wondered if that's a, yeah. is that a valid uh, argument in, a, in, the, in the public democratic discussion? Yeah. Think? That's a wonderful point. And I, uh, I, what's so interesting about it to me is that in the legal discourse, in the human rights stuff I teach, um, it's very secular. And it's very, don't talk to me about compassion. These people have rights, you know? And in fact, I think that's an enfeebling way to go. I think that uh, uh, the biblical injunction uh, to be compassionate and generous to a stranger has historically been as powerful a source of American generosity towards refugees as anything. And I just think it's stupid. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a kind of liberal guy, but I think it's stupid to condescend to the languages of compassion and generosity that come from religious faith. Because frankly, we need all the arguments we can to get people to step up. And we know as an empirical fact, I, I know this from Canada particularly, that the single institutions that do the most in refugee resettlement in my country are the, are the church faith-based groups, but hands down, you know, mosques and gurdwaras and temples and, you know, churches, they're the folks who step up. And their language is not a language of rights. It's a language of we're all children of God and it, and also that other very simple thing, it could be me. You know, I mean, I feel strongly about this because I, you know, my my family were refugees, so that's why that's my stake. It's not about rights to me. It's just it could have been me, you know. And I think we need to we need to strengthen that. And I, you know, I've been critical of American refugee policy, but it's very important for Americans to remember that the United States takes sixty five thousand refugees a year from around the world. So there's a big history of, of generous support for the UNHCR and the American tradition, and you don't want that to be 
pounded into bits by you know, bad domestic politics. It's something that people don't notice, but the world notices. The problem has been that <clears throat> uh, I think that because of the exceptional circumstances of the Syrian crisis, the United States should step up and have a special quota for, for Syrians, and that's the thing that the president has said, I'll take 10,000, but I think the, the actual number that would make a difference is up in the 50,000 range. But frankly, right now, that's politically pretty, pretty difficult. It's difficult because we're in a primary season. We're difficult because uh, the president does not want to give gifts to, the, to, to one side of the argument and allow them to pound the potential Democratic nominee. And all that, I won't go into the politics, but the politics are very adverse. And I'm hoping in 2017, if we have a new regime, people put this stuff aside and we start thinking about. Because the, the point I would then go on to make is, um, just as I don't think a legal language of obligation is good enough, we need a religious language of obligation, which is your point. So I think that thinking about refugees as simply a humanitarian issue misses the crucial fact that it's also a geostrategic issue. Um, if Europe falls apart because of this refugee crisis, that is bad for the security of the United States. And, we gotta, and I think the United States needs to understand just how important a stable, prosperous Europe has always been to the prosperity and stability of the United States. And so you want to <clears throat> put the humanitarian stuff together with the strategic stuff, just as you want to put the legal stuff together with the language of compassion. Hi, I'm, I'm with you on the importance of the rights, and my gut screams that we shouldn't limit it because there may be a terrorist in the line. Yeah. Um, but. I don't know how to counter that argument when I hear it yeah. every day. How do you counter that argument? Um, well, I, I did a submission to the, the Obama administration in which I said, you know, the United States ought to remember that when we took in 5,000, we surged 5,000 Kosovar refugees uh, uh, in 1999. How did we do it? We sent them all to Fort Dix. I mean, one way to do this, if you're concerned about security, is just flow them through a, 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 a sealed U.S. base, and then you really can co-locate all the security clearance you need to make sure that these folks are absolutely, uh, you know, you can really take the, the risk factor down to pretty close to zero. That would be number one argument. Number two argument, your neighbor to the north has just taken in 25,000, and they did it in six weeks, and they did it by co-locating the security screening in Turkey and Lebanon and Jordan. They put officials out there and just looked at these people very carefully. Anybody with a potential security threat was screened out and they, and they, and they made their triage that way. And they, I think they'll be fine. And Canada you know, knows about terrorism. We've had a serious terrorist attack just you know, 14 months ago, but we were able to do it nonetheless. So. Um, yeah, it, 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 it's, a, it's a difficult argument uh, to run, but, uh, you know, the, the other argument to run is, is more simple and basic, um, which is the, uh, the refugees are not the terrorists. The refugees are fleeing from the terrorists. That drowned baby boy, his dad was trying to get his family out of Kobani, which was under under IS control. So uh, the really honest thing to say is let's not set our hair on fire here. There's risk. Nothing's going to be perfect. But do we sacrifice the entire traditions of American generosity <laughs> because of security concerns? I don't think we should. I, I think it's also stupid politics. I mean, stupid politics in the sense that the last thing you want to say to IS, and I take this terrorist threat as seriously as anybody, is to allow IS to dictate the policies of a great country. America does not allow its refugee and migration policies to be, to, to, to be dictated by terrorists. Simple as that, you know? So.
I'm another daughter of a refugee, and my father was not allowed into the United States because he was from a country that was seen as a danger to the U.S., mm -hmm. Russia. No. Um, so it's very close to my heart, too. Um, do you have pragmatic suggestions as to how to shift the conversation or that big pie that says disapprove, disapprove, yeah. in a way and in a culture so different than Canada yeah. and in the kind of media climate, political climate we're in? Yeah. That, too, is a wonderful question. And I, I, I think... Uh, I think you need to do a kind of situational analysis of where your friends are. What strikes me is that there are a lot of organizations in the United States um, when it, that, that support refugee settlement and always have. Um, the headlines give you, you know, 37 governors have closed the door to refugees. Beneath the headlines, there are countless mayors across the United States who are smart enough to know that um, they need refugees, and particularly uh, towns with declining or struggling populations. Um, it's very, very striking how many mayors in the United States are actually really keen to have more, to settle more refugees, because it's a way of reviving their communities. So that's one area of support. The second area of support are faith-based groups. Uh, third area of group is area of support are uh, refugee resettlement agencies, which are spread right across the United States and are anchored in communities and have in turn their own networks of support. And then there's, there is more um, uh, congressional support on the Hill than you would suppose. I think Dick Durbin, uh, a number of other senators are actually pro-refugee and are willing to hold hearings and willing to use uh, the congressional bully pulpit to, to, to rally support. So like any piece of politics, you have to find out where your friends are and then begin leveraging them. Um, I think at the moment, right now, 2016, it's, it's, it's adverse. It's difficult to, to move for a whole set of reasons. But I think uh, 2017, uh, uh, new day, I, I think. So you've got to get your timing right. That would be the other thing. And you have to make these arguments. You have to make the arguments that we've been making about keeping faith with America's best traditions, uh, not allowing the bad guys to dictate our policies, understanding that there are some strategic reasons for doing this, not just straight humanitarian reasons, uh, using the legal arguments, but also the arguments from faith and compassion. We've got to put it all out there. And it's a long, it's a long, it's a long, hard go. And you can't expect this will ever be a kind of majority support thing. I mean, support for refugees has always been, as I say, a lagging indicator. Um, uh, but uh, um, we often look back on acts of generosity and think that was, that was, that's who we are. And the Hungarians are the classic example of this. I was driven in from, from uh, uh, Kansas City by a, by a Hungarian refugee as it happens. I mean, he just blesses the, blesses the ground he walks on being in the United States. And so, you know, you need, you need to trigger that as well, the enormous gratitude of millions of Americans for the fact that they were granted citizenship in this country. That's a, that's a huge thing to call on. But it's all about the better angels of our nature, isn't it, to connect to last night? I mean, it, it really is. And it's, it's always difficult to conjure up the better angels. I've heard you um, say a couple of times now over the last two days that Europe is, in a sense, collapsing under the, the weight of yeah. what you're talking about and that America seems to be on the sidelines, not really helping that uh, collapse. And I'm not underestimating the sheer numbers involved in the refugee crisis in Europe. But if you compared it, say, with the population movements around the time of the Second World War or immediately afterwards, the, the current numbers surely shrink into almost insignificance by the side of those kinds of movements. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm surprised, therefore, that you, you believe that Europe is unable to handle, mm -hmm. um, admittedly, a crisis, but still the numbers are not so vast as far as I can see. Yeah. Uh, that's, a very good, there, that's a very good point, and it's not so much the numbers. It's the fact that burden sharing is broken down. The problem is not the numbers, the problem is the politics. 
the problem is that uh, you've got 28 countries and most of them are saying we're not taking any refugees. So it, it fractures the political coalition that keeps um, Europe together. Europe is a coalition in which you pool sovereignty uh, for the sake of common benefits. And what's happening is we're having a re-sovereignized EU in which people say, I'll be part of the club provided I, provided I don't have to pay any dues. And long term, that's extremely damaging to the cohesion of this, this project. But you're right about the numbers. I mean, you don't have to go back to 1945 to 48 when there were like 10, 12, 15 million Europeans on the move, many of them Germans. You just have to look at uh, Lebanon and Jordan. I mean, the United States is sitting here scratching its head saying, how can we take 3,000 people when little Jordan with a population of, what is it, five, six, eight million people has got 1.5 million refugees from Syria. You know, the country is just absorbed it all. And, and Lebanon, even more fragile, even more difficult, has got 25% of its population as refugees. So the numbers, um, you know, the, the only countries with a real numbers issue are the frontline states. And that's another thing the United States can do. It's done, it has taken the lead there, which is funding the, the refugee assistance in the frontline states. But the, fr the, front line, the, the agencies dealing with refugee issues in the frontline states are about 50% underfunded. So the United States has led here, but it needs to get a lot of people in to stump up and pay their dues. There's a tremendous amount of free riding in the international system is what I'm saying. There's free riding in Europe, Europeans not sharing burdens. And then in terms of refugee assistance, um, you know, a couple of countries are carrying much more of the load than the rest. The Saudis are sitting back, not doing anything for their fellow Muslim brothers. I mean, there's lots of stuff that, uh, you know, the United States has every right to, to um, step up and call them out on. So, anyway. I'm still struck by the language the title of the talk, which citizens owe strangers, and it's a really specific framework, and we can see how that kind of language really dictates the responses that we see. Mm -hmm. So in our own political climate right now, if someone's asked, what do citizens owe illegals, um, or even undocumented, or aliens, or any of these other words, it, it really shapes the way people respond to a question like that. And we've already answered the question in some ways of what do humans owe each other. I mean, that is human rights law generally, and refugee law specifically, and so, I'm curious if you can elaborate even more on the kind of pragmatic spaces for possibility in changing that public discourse or changing the terms of that debate a little bit because I'm sympathetic to the need for democratic consent but I'm also one of those people that believes that these are, these are rights and that we're already limiting the conversation by the, the way it's being framed in the first place. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I think you've picked up exactly what's um, provoking and, and controversial about what I'm saying. <clears throat> and I've given this, I, I never give the same talk, I hasten to add. I never, you know, it's always different. But whenever I talk this language, people say, wait, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Why are you setting up this dichotomy between citizens and strangers, rightless people and people with rights? It's, it's uh, conceding too much to the, to the discourse. Um, but I just think that honesty here requires us to, to just fess up to the fact that um, citizens do distinguish the rights that they have from, uh, uh, and, and believe that part of what makes a, a nation a nation and a state a state is the capacity to accord rights to people who come in. And so the illegal immigration issue in the United States, and I'm extremely in favor of rapid, fulsome, generous paths to citizenship for illegal migrants. I mean, God almighty, if you're, if you're in that hotel where I'm staying and everybody who's cleaning my bedroom is uh, uh, Hispanic, uh, I want those young women to, to become Americans as fast as possible and I'm actually Yes, I understand that illegal entry is a problem and you've got to sort that out, but you've got to have a path towards turning strangers into citizens as fast as you can. Uh, and, and illegal migration has been, is, has been a moral and political disaster because it's a wage suppression device. It's divisive. 
Uh, it, present, it prevents the children of those, those uh, fine women from you know, getting up the ladder. It has all kinds of negative consequences. So, um, and, and I think the, <clears throat> the political impasse over this has, has been um, a tragic error for the United States. Uh, and I, I'm not proposing amnesty, I know all that. I understand the moral objections to amnesty, but there gotta be a way to, to break down the division between strangers and citizens. And I think that it's important always to emphasize that uh, refugees who, uh, you know, the rights that were accorded to refugees in 1951 in the convention are incredibly important. Uh, non refoulement we're not gonna send you back to get persecuted. And if you can prove to us that you've been persecuted, you, you get on in. I mean, I, I just think, I can't imagine an international order without that. I mean, it, it will be um, horrible. I just think human rights um, absolutists often, I think, just ignore the fact that maintaining and sustaining that fabric of international law is crucially dependent on manufacturing and reproducing democratic consent. And if you don't do it, uh, you're going to lose it all. Maybe we'll make this the, the maybe we'll make this the last one. No pressure, of course. Um, so I keep turning over this question of democratic consent, uh, piggybacking a bit off the the previous question. Um, and I suppose maybe I want to be a little more controversial. Uh, immigration politics, refugee politics have always been very elite politics. Mm -hmm. Elites really like diversity, pluralism, and inexpensive labor, uh, and they don't have to deal with the consequences of having lots of low-wage workers in their neighborhoods or in their schools. Um, I've been trying to think of when the last time in the United States there was a straight-up public debate over immigration or refugees' status in which voters got a, a, a real say in the matter and the liberal side won. Mm -hmm. um, in the last big immigration reform, I mean, there's one in the 80s, but uh, going back to the 1960s, it was really important that most of the South couldn't vote for mm -hmm. the major immigration reform in the mid-1960s. Mm -hmm. um, has there ever been a case that you can think in which a real democratic debate has went the way we liberals mm -hmm. wanted no. it to go? Um, and which is to say, just to uh, maybe a little more controversial, when we say being pragmatic or mm. managing debate, we mean overcoming natural resistance to no. lots of migrants, no. which is a being undemocratic, trying to, to mm -hmm. get around the democratic problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good challenge. Um, I was gonna irritate you still further by saying, well, in Canada, uh, we, we actually have sustained democratic consent for multiculturalism. It's a complicated story, but we actually did it. Um, uh, Large-scale immigration to our country has been extremely popular. Well, we haven't got many people anyway, and we've got a lot of real estate, so it's kind of going to be easier by definition. I concede all that. And, you know, because we're perfect, everything's easier for us. Um, <laughs> but... Um, I think you're raising a, uh, um, and I could also say that the politics of this uh, are changing very rapidly. As you get 15, 16% of the American population is Hispanic and they get citizenship. Um, as people live in um, uh, hyper diverse cities like New York and Los Angeles, big population centers are now more and more diverse. People turn out to think, yeah, this is all right, this is working. Um, uh, let's not get sentimental about hyper-diversity. It's consistent with high degrees of residential segregation and apartness and, and wage segmentation between uh, ethnic groups. It's not necessarily a, you know, morally always a pretty sight, but it's not failing. You know, it's not, it's not even ghettoized. It's often quite, there's a quite, you know, you go to LA, you go to Queens, New York, where I've spent some time studying this precise issue, what you see is you've got a success on your hands. I mean, it's a complicated success. But that then, but my point being is that that then generates public consent for migration. It generates public consent for, for multiculturalism. Now, it's, you know, it, it, it's 
all America is not Los Angeles and New York. I'm keenly aware, and if you in Kansas, that seems pretty self-evident. But uh, the whole country is being changed by immigration. Um, and I think a lot of people um, may like it simply because it, you know, the labor's cheap, but said they, they derive economic advantage. But I think, um, uh, so I, I'm, I guess I'm resisting your sense that if you give people the choice, they'll all say no. I think, in fact, it's, it's changing over time. What I would concede, however, is that when you look at the politics of, of immigration reform, I mean, almost nobody can remember the changes to the 1965 Immigration Act that occurred kind of somewhere in that civil rights revolution. Nobody kind of noticed that we changed the immigration rules and suddenly we went from white-only immigration to Asian immigration and, and black immigration and immigration from all over the world. And it kind of happened in a fit of absence of mind as part of Johnson's Great Society. And hey presto, suddenly we've got very diverse cities 25 years later. It, did people consent to that? You bet they didn't. I mean, it just ha it kind of just happened as part of the civil rights revolution. So, and when you then look at the politics of consent in Europe, one of the things that, and, and here where I would, I would connect to what you're saying, the elites basically said, we need the cheap labor and you're gonna suck it up, is what the elites said to the European population. And there is now a huge backlash. People said, we were never asked that we were going to have Muslim neighbors. We were never asked that you know, our, our way of life was going to be changed so much. And they're saying that in Denmark. They're saying that in Sweden. They're saying that in France. They're even saying that a bit in Germany. And that's why the, democratic, the problem of democratic consent is so important. Because when you kind of take it for granted and say, you know, we know best and this is good for you and you'll, you'll learn to love this, you eventually get yourself a heck of a backlash. And that's, I think, what we are seeing in, in, in Europe. So, I take the issue very seriously, and it leads me directly up to your question, which is, how does a liberal or progressive politician stand up and say, here's what I think we ought to do with immigration and not get just clobbered? At the moment in Europe, it's, 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 pretty, it's pretty difficult. But, you know, Angela Merkel, I mean, interestingly, has said, this is good for us, folks, and let me explain why. It's good for us because our population is aging, our demographics are out of whack, um, uh, we need this labor, we need this opportunity, we need this ambition that these folks bring. Uh, and he, she's holding on by her fingernails, but she is the politician making this case. And I'm saying she can make this case provided she can show the German public she's got the borders under control. If she can't get those borders under control, she's done. It's just that simple. She can make the case for a an orderly pro uh, refugee policy, provided it's orderly and under control. If she can't, that's, that's, that's where she loses it. And uh, so I just think that, um, kind of to conclude, that, that the, the politics of this that you're framing in your question is kind of the biggest single political issue in confronting the politics of advanced democracies in the 21st century. It's, it's the big one because it raises issues of our identity. It raises a, it issues about terrorism and security, which were raised earlier. It raises fundamental questions about kind of who we are. It raises questions about our traditions of generosity. It raises questions about globalization. You know, can, can, we, can we ride this tiger of globalization and not end up inside it? It raises all those issues. And, um, and I think that uh, my bottom line on it is that uh, the politics of it means unless, unless you can give a sense to the public you have this under control, that the sovereign state knows what it's doing and is not uh, letting it just get out of control. You can guide your publics uh, and maintain their consent in the 21st century. I sure hope so. Anyway, thank you so much for, for listening. <laughs>